Wow. Oh, hey there. My name's Ross, and I'm a bit of a nerd for all things nature. So a while ago, I started a passion project called well, nerdy about nature. It began as social media videos sharing cool fun facts and tidbits of wisdom about the natural world and has since evolved in this podcast that you're tuning into here. This project serves as means to inspire, educate, and engage folks with the outdoor world so that we can all become better stewards of it and so that we can all work together to create a more inclusive, diverse, equitable, and just future for each and every one of us in this world that we all share. Because nature, it's pretty dang neat, you know? I think we should keep it that way. So come on, let's go get nerdy about nature. Come and take a nature walk with me, we're gonna check out some really cool trees, we're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can't live without, let's go get nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby, nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, come on, let's get nerdy about nature. Ah, what's up, my fellow nerds? Welcome to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. Hope you're all doing well. Um, Have you ever bought a box of tissues or toilet paper or maybe some two by fours, plywood, lumber of some kind, Uh, furniture at Ikea is a big one, or even just a box of crackers or something mundane from the grocery store. And on it, seen that fancy little logo that says that the trees used to make whatever product it may be are from a sustainable source? You know the ones, they're really slick green lines that form a cute little tree or leaf logo, often accompanied by three little letters that shows which accreditation system was used. Well, unfortunately, those certifications, no matter which one it may be, aren't the most ethical, accurate, and in some cases are just downright bogus, and it may not truly reflect the logging practices used to obtain that wood. Now, at the moment, there currently isn't a certification standard that actually verifies that wood and forest products are obtained in a truly sustainable manner, no matter where you are in the world, which is kind of a bummer, right? So today on the podcast, I'm sitting down with Peter Wood to chat all about these issues as he's been working with them for decades and knows all of the in and outs. Now, Peter is incredibly well-spoken and detailed-oriented, and we hit the ground running in this episode with tons of really great nerdy content right out the gate, so I hope you're ready for it. Um, I trust that many of you will be able to kind of pick it up and and follow along as we go. Um, So Peter is a senior campaigner with Canopy Planet, working to create sustainable forest management models around the world, in addition to being an adjunct professor at the Faculty of Forestry at UBC, as well as being a consultant for organizations like EcoJustice. Now, For every episode, I make a donation to the guest nonprofit of choice, which you will find out later on here. And this is made possible thanks to the generous support from all of my lovely Patreon supporters. So if you're enjoying this stuff and would like to support it as well, you can learn more at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature or by visiting my website at nerdyaboutnature.com. So stay tuned for all of that info and more towards the end of the episode, as well as a couple different updates. Um, And for now, let's jump into the nitty gritty with Peter here to learn all about greenwashing, sustainable certifications, the ongoing eco-justice legal challenge about these issues, and what you can do to help push for change in these certification processes so we can all create a better model for the future. Welcome, yep. Peter, to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. Thanks for joining me here. Great. Thanks to be here. Um, I, last yeah. episode I did with Charlotte, mm-hmm. she kicked off the tradition of the speaker or my guest beatboxing into the microphones. Oh, okay. Wow. If you'd like to... <laughs> nice. Nice. That's what I got. Very good. I'll take it. <laughs> um, you want to start by introducing yourself and telling me a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got to where you are, what you do. Sure thing. Uh, so I wear a, a, a few hats right now. Uh, my primary job, I'm a senior campaigner with uh, Canopy Planet, uh, which is a, a forest conservation organization uh, that works with uh, partners all over the world to eliminate ancient and endangered forests out of the supply chains uh, of uh, various brands. Uh, I'm also uh, uh, part-time, I've been an adjunct uh, professor at the Faculty of Forestry uh, at UBC. Uh, And then I also have uh, uh, been doing some consulting uh, work for uh, groups like EcoJustice uh, for, you know, specific contracts and and research. And your background, you have a a big law background, I'm assuming. I did my PhD in... uh, 
international uh, uh, forest policy and governance and uh, uh, looking at um, international law and how uh, uh, those international laws impact uh, forest management was was part of that. Yeah. And like right before we began recording, you were giving me a pretty big backgrounder on... Um on the issues because so say we're here we're going to be talking about like basically greenwashing within the forestry sector especially here in bc and then on global scales what's that what that means all the certification processes but before we get into all that heavy stuff do you want to just talk to me about like your background how you got into this world and how long you've been doing it all that Sure thing. So fresh out of uh, undergrad, uh, I did my undergrad in environmental studies at UBC. But my first job was uh, looking at uh, how forest certification was being implemented in British Columbia. And I was working for the Ministry of Forests of BC. Uh, They were kind of interested in this new phenomenon where, uh, you know, companies were going to get audited and certified to a, a specific type of you know forest management standard and on the basis of that they could market their products as being uh, from sustainable sources the theory being that consumers would look for that label and be willing to either pay a premium or willing to seek it out to make sure that their products were certified now BC at the time was mostly worried about uh, foreign markets especially in the EU uh, not wanting to take their products anymore because of Clackwat Sound. So Clackwat Sound, big uh, uh, controversy, thousands, thousand people arrested, uh, a lot of global scrutiny around BC forest practices. So, so this is yeah. the 90s that you're doing all this. Yeah, that's right. So right so, after the war in the woods. That's right. So I I started in like 1999 working for. Uh, the government on this issue. And that was the big concern. And so I wrote a report that looked at, you know, what it would look like to implement this international forestry standard uh, called the Forestry Stewardship Council system, FSC. And I wrote this, uh, you know, actually a couple of reports that looked at, you know, what it might look like to implement uh, uh, this new practice. Um, And when it was clear that uh, government wasn't really that interested, I think, in making some of those major changes that were going to be required. What I witnessed was that uh, instead of going for the forest certification system led by Indigenous people and environmental groups, that they started to favor going towards uh, emerging systems that were created by industry. So uh, the forest industry felt threatened by this, this uh, you know, NGO-led system. And so, yeah, they just created their own and they just started uh, uh, certifying just about everything. It it became quite easy for them to get a large volume of uh, forestry products uh, on the market with this certification. So, you know, in the early days, you had commitments by like Home Depot and Ikea and big, big uh, uh, producers or sort of big... uh, um, uh, you know, manufacturers, manufacturers yeah. of forest products were, you know, being pressured into making commitments to only sell sustainably sourced wood. But then instead of just insisting on FSC, they started saying, well, actually any certification system will do. Um, and and so that really opened the doors for industry to take over. And uh, and so that, that led me to, um, you know, I ended up doing my PhD on looking at how some of these international systems uh, were being implemented because I I really wanted to know, like, who cares? Like, we're spending all this time doing certification. Let's go see in the woods, like, are companies actually having to make any changes? And um, the conclusion, you know, that I came to out of my PhD, uh, you know, too too long uh, didn't read uh, is like basically it it still comes down to government's uh, systems that underlie it that really count and there's no substitute for good governance good uh, forest practices regulations enforcement of those regulations because what I saw and this is you know my my, my PhD dissertation looked at BC Alberta Quebec Ontario uh, in each instance like most of the changes that were required were only to meet existing law. Like it wasn't like the certification system was really making like massive changes on its own. It was often deferring to 
government's uh, uh, observations of what was going on on the ground. <clears throat> right. So there's like government established forest practices, like the law that like anybody harvesting in a forest has to follow. And then FSC came about trying to create higher standards. That's right. To certify what is quote unquote sustainable based on those standards. Um, and then you have other companies like SFI that have come about that are industry backed as just like a certification thing. But even though the the basis of like policy hasn't changed, like the methods, how forests can be logged. Yeah. So, so th- basically with FSC, there's some things that are, you know, about looking after species. There's some things that are about respecting indigenous rights. Uh, FSC was the first system that I know of that required free prior and informed consent. So that was a, a concept really initiated by FSC. And that, this is back in 1999 though. Uh, yeah. They, they, the FSC started in 1993. And so I think it was really, uh, quite progressive at the time for requiring yeah. that. Does it still no. require that? Still requires that. Yeah. yeah. So the other systems uh, didn't require that. They required, uh, they deferred to existing government consultation of Indigenous people, but we're not requiring that FPIC, the the consent part of it. Um, I think uh, the one of the industry systems tried to make their own kind of FPIC, but have the C stand for consultation instead of consent. So they're like, we're doing FPIC, but it's like free prior and informed consultation. And it's like, hmm, that's really different than consent. Which could be like an email <laughs> asking for permission, but regardless of the answer, you're that's, going ahead and doing it. That's it. But they can say, we did, we're doing FPIC. It's, it's that kind of weaselly tactic that I've, I've seen that, that gets me, gets my blood boiling, which, which, you know, brings me to why I'm here today. It's like this whole system has created this like anger in me that when I see these kind of tactics is greenwash that I like, I can't, I can't let it pass. Like I, I, I have to sort of, you know, call it out. And so, you know, through the course of, uh, you know, the, over the years, there's been different ways that I've I've tried to tackle this. I worked in the Congo with a, a group called Global Witness. They're like a human rights uh, environmental organization because there was a lot of companies that were FSC certified uh, that were starting to use this as like a green cover for you know, getting kind of a free pass on what they were doing. Uh, you know, I started working on uh, an issue called controlled wood, which is you know, FSC started certifying not only the things that they were actually sending auditors out into the woods to like make sure it was cool, but they started blanket certifying like whole countries saying, okay, in general, this area is kind of low risk for illegal logging for, you know, all these like big picture concerns. Let's just, let's just have this whole area be considered controlled wood. And so I, I, I was on the the technical committee for that for about six years before giving up because it was so clear that there it was going way off the charts in terms of credibility. Uh, I just didn't want to support that anymore. Um, and and so yeah, I think that's overall the trend I've seen is that FSC ha- as as much as I loved it at the beginning, I've seen it how it's had to bow to pressure because of these alternative industry systems that are competing with it, it's kind of had to uh, be be more and more lax with the rules. And at the same time, a lot of the environmental groups that were there at the beginning, they, they kind of disappeared either because they gave up on it because it was just, uh, uh, you know, too far gone. They, they saw it as being, you know, going towards greenwash. So they just uh, quit in protest uh, or they just lack the capacity because it's so time consuming to have to review documents, to have to go to meetings, to have to participate in the system. And if they don't have funding from these uh, donors anymore, uh, that that kind of moved on, to be honest, from the, the 90s, they really haven't backed uh, uh you know, the scrutiny of these systems anymore. Uh, So what we're left with is a system that was created in the 90s that's still here, but kind of like this zombie system that is now not like being held to any kind of, you know, accountability by the groups that created it uh, because they've kind of given up on it. But that doesn't stop industry from using this all the time and rolling out their green cred in in terms of, uh, you know, how they're uh, able to uh, say that what they're doing is sustainable. God, like the 
deliberate manipulation of like the way that consumers are perceiving a good is just so heartbreaking to see. But I thought like FSC is still probably the best one out there as far as forest certification goes. It is. And I would say that FSC has got systems still in place that allow you to contest a certification. I still feel confident that if I have a, a problem, I know that I can lodge a complaint. With SFI and, and other systems under uh, uh, the industry-led systems of the world, I don't feel like you really have that uh, channel to protest. Uh, and so that that's one thing I would still give to FSC. They have a, a fairly robust system, a, a complaint system, uh, and I've seen that work. Um, I've even been hired by FSC, uh, or sorry, ASI, the Accreditation Services International, which is like, there's a body over FSC that like, if you don't like FSC's verdict, you can appeal and there's like a higher body. And so I've been a consultant that did some of that work too. And it's really, that's quite robust. The industry systems, like they don't care. They can just like, you can have a complaint. Uh, just, just for an example, like if there's a complaint, uh, we had that uh, a bunch of companies that were certified to the Canadian Standards Association, CSA, uh, for they were logging in caribou habitat, like straight up clear cuts in caribou habitat should be completely against uh, some, a standard that says it's it's a sustainable forest management standard. And and they did not care. Like they like we did not even really get like a response. They can just ignore it. There's no actual requirement to do anything. So, um, yeah. I, Versus I thought, like if you were to complain about someone or a, a wood that's like FSC certified, you have like a third party overarching body that would be able to look into that exactly and it's somewhat neutral and it can like audit the processes and make sure that they're true to like what they're they're doing exactly they're exactly so with fsc you've got this um uh, accreditation services that like you can appeal to if you don't like what fsc is doing it's a really nice uh, uh layer that adds uh, a bit of uh neutrality and independence to it um and and that becomes really important because a lot of things in forestry as you know get really, really heated. And there's there's uh, a lot of politics and emotions involved. It's really good to have good process, good kind of neutral bodies like that. Um, and if you look at the governance, if you go to like SFI's, you know, board of governors uh, or, or the board of directors, you know, you can see like it's just completely dominated by like the very companies that get certified by SFI. Right. So it's like Can for West Forest Products, West Fraser. You'll all exactly. those are like on the board of SFI. You'll yeah, exactly. You'll see you'll see a lot of industry representation. Uh, they have a few token like non-industry people as well, but typically you're not going to see like any real critics of the forest industry there. They're all pretty much on board. Whereas you go to FSC, like they have this really unique requirement to have a balance of indigenous groups. Uh, social chamber, which can be like labor unions, economic chamber, which is largely, you know, forest industry, but could also be like, you know, value added wood products manufacturing, uh, and then the environmental group chamber. And that has equal uh, representation on any standards committee or governance. And then in additionally, globally, FSE requires a balance of international uh, sorry uh, global south uh, representation largely right. developing countries yeah and global north representation that's cool so that's kind of important so it's not just like you know big ngos from the north telling everybody what to do it keeps us in check yeah yeah so it's uh it's complicated um and it's gone on for about you know 30 years now. But right now, what's really interesting is we're seeing how this plays out with some big issues like climate change, right? So right now, the world has recognized that deforestation as well as forest degradation uh, and, and the difference between those two is basically deforestation, you have to clear a forest completely and convert it to another use. Degradation is just anything short of that. So uh, you know, if you're if you're logging it, but there's still some trees left, uh, that's that's degradation. So we're yeah, seeing you're both changing like the the mm -hmm. mix, the ecological function of those forests through like mm -hmm. outside forces, e exactly human, human processes, exactly. So so right now we're seeing that those two things 
uh, are responsible for, you know, some estimates have as much as uh, 15 to 20 percent of the climate change problem is is due to, uh, 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 you know, losing losing our forests. So we know this losing is important. quality of forests because that's like yeah. an important mm-hmm. distinction to make. Like I know Canada uses that one to get off out of out of trouble quote unquote all the time because deforestation in Canada is relatively low but forest degradation is like third highest in the world behind Brazil and another country uh yeah i mean there's Probably Russia uh, Russia uh, for intact forest loss uh Canada uh Russia Brazil are, are pretty pretty high up mm-hmm. but, but Canada also boasts that it has the most sustainable forest industry in the world or it has until as until lately when the EU starts like poking and prodding about getting products that aren't linked to defor or to degradation. Yeah. So that that's right. So because of the definition, the technical definition of forest, okay? This is this is going to get real nerdy here if you're, okay. I hope you're on board for it. So the 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 internationally accepted definition of forest includes clear cuts. Oh wait. Okay. A clear cut is a clear cut is a forest under the internationally defined, and why? Because you have an intention that that will eventually grow back. Right. So this is very much a product of having, uh, you know, foresters define what a forest is, and so they see clear cutting as being part of forest management. The, so in order to count that you actually don't have a forest there like anymore, a deforestation, you have to convert it to another use, like palm oil or um, you know, uh, urban development, as long as it has the potential to come back as a forest, as long as you're designating that as part as a forest management unit, it will always be considered forest, even when it's a clear cut. So (laughs) so to revamp, so it's like you could have a 4,000 year old, old growth forest, like all sorts of complexity, all sorts of biodiversity, you clear cut it and you replant it to be on 60 year rotations of like the you know the same mix of of trees that exist there naturally but only on 60 years and that just counts as forestry just being good and grand and everything's it's sustained yeah the forest there you're not it's not deforestation because you're not changing the use of the land but it's forest degradation because you're drastically changing the quality of forest that exists on those lands that that's exactly why this this distinction and and introducing the concept of degradation is everything and and if you want to really understand why canada uh is up in arms over the eu uh uh, restricting products that are associated with degradation it's exactly what you just said because that catches it right the degradation will catch canada in all the degradation it's caused in primary forests uh in a way that the deforestation statistics never were going to register what we were doing. So, so here's the here's the million dollar question: Is uh, uh, will will forest management, as currently practiced in Canada, be restricted uh, based on these new European Union regulations that were just just adopted? And everyone's going to be trying to figure this out. So, watch this space. This is going to be a battleground. This is where industry is going to roll out their forest certification statistics, their green cred, um, the, their their claims that Canada has the best forest management uh, practice in the, practices in the world. This will be where that debate happens. And it will be very interesting to see if the EU uh, will give a green lane pass to certified products by virtue of if they are s- certified as being sustainable, then then they're not causing degradation. Right. So, yeah. And that's where yeah. you get into the, the definitions of different certifications. So exactly. to kind yeah. of backtrack a little bit, like, let's just go over, like, what are some of the like common practices um, associated with like an FSC certification? Like, what can you, uh, how can you manage a forest and, and have it be certified under FSC standards? So, there's uh there's kind of like these ten commandments, uh, <laughs> like literally there's ten. Thou you know, shalt not cut more. Than <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's there's ten different principles, and and you know about fifty odd uh, criteria under that internationally, and the really interesting part about FSC is that like they then take those and tailor it to the local context because like sustainable 
forestry in the Congo is not the same as sustainable forestry in Vancouver Island. So you you have yeah, so that's basically the starting point is you would have these general principles like maintaining ecological integrity. Okay, what does that mean in in the Congo? What does that mean in Vancouver Island? And is that that's based yeah. on biogeoclimatic zones and an ecological makeup of each system. That's right. So yeah. it's supposed to be adapted to suit that that local uh, context, which is awesome in theory. Which you know? is awesome in theory. So like a clear cut yeah. in the interior of the province, where like forest fire, where they're replicating forest fires, where forest fires are more common, could be larger than say a clear cut out here, where forest fires are less common on the coast. You would have like different sizes. Like, that's that's right. Yeah, and you would have things like um, different imp- different uh, issues would be more important, like riparian zone management, super important in the coastal uh, region. Uh, where do you have uh, migratory salmon? Well, you've got to accommodate that. So all of this nuance depends on something. It depends on people showing up to insist on those standards being upheld defined properly. And so in that, in those uh, early days that I, I participated uh, in, in some of this negotiation uh, of the standards, or I was supporting a group that was negotiating those standards, I watched some fantastic people. Uh, uh, and I would say just to note, to a nod to International Women's Day this week, by far and by far and large, the the most part were some phenomenal uh, women leaders in 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 forest conservation. Uh, we're at the table. We're absolutely insisting that when we do those definitions of ecosystem integrity of riparian zone, I mean, they went to the mat. We're talking like tears were shed around the table of negotiation with with industry uh, to come to those uh, really insist on a high bar for those standards. People like Jessica Clogg, uh, uh, West Coast Environmental Law, uh, uh, Lisa Mateus, um, you know, uh, Nicole Rycroft, Tamara Stark. These are people I still work with. I was amazed at how much work had to go in to, uh, uh, you know, upholding those very strong requirements. And now, it, it makes me a little worried that in order to have integrity in the system, you really need people there making sure that it gets implemented. And the truth is that a lot of people didn't have the capacity to always be upholding that. And I think that's what we're seeing play out now. So yeah. since those folks were in there getting all those rigorous standards set, you, you think that like the FSC standards have like waned under pressure from uh, other certifications like SFI that are much weaker and in industry run? So that's become weaker on their side? Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the for me, it was controlled wood. And, and again, this is like, this is a little nerdy, but so important that this idea of controlled wood uh, meant that you don't actually have to get certified to FSC to get a label on there. You just had to... Uh, uh, make sure that a general area like all of Canada would be evaluated for risk of different issues. And if you could find that there was low risk of, you know, uh, certain uh, very coarse requirements, then then you would be allowed to mix uh, your uh product in and so if so, you have one forest over here that's doing it well but another forest just down the street that's not if it's all gets kind of lumped into the same and like dried at the same kiln at the mill then like it's all certified that that's right because i mean what what happened was like there was a problem getting enough certified material going in to like justify having like a whole mill that was just for FSC. So they're like, okay, we're gonna have to mix a bunch of sources, but we have to make sure that those other sources aren't mixed coming from like illegally logged or like really bad sources. So controlled wood was a way at the beginning to just like allow for mixing uh, and, and still have the FSC stuff to come out with the, you know, being able to the label stamp, it. Yeah. yeah. And so good intentions, but in the end, what happened is that people kind of stopped caring about the actual FSC certified wood, and they really just started accepting this this kind of like lower standard uh, as just being controlled as being enough. And so the default is like people aren't really super interested in getting certified. Why would you bother with all the expense of getting certified if you can just pass under this like backdoor channel, the bare minimum, under the bare minimum under control wood? So th- and there's still some rules around like you have to have a minimum amount of fsc to to mix with it uh you know but but all to say like i think that that has kind of undermined things uh and uh you know and uh, but but again compared to the 
uh, industry systems, which are like complete greenwash. Uh, it really like we, we, then it's going to towards like the eco justice, um, uh, legal challenge of, of those systems. Before we get into um, SFI, yeah. like that whole lawsuit, like mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about what makes SFI management, for example, mm -hmm. different yeah. than an FSC. Sure. So, uh, under SFI, uh, instead of having performance based system, like with the FSC, you know, for example, you have to demonstrate that you're not harming, you know, endangered species. Uh, you have to demonstrate that you've retained uh, a certain buffer around a salmon stream. Um, that's, that's what I would call performance standards. You know when you have met it and you know when you have not met it and you can be held to something kind of fixed, right? Yeah, like you're held fixed. accountable to like saying or doing what you say you're going to do. It's, it's basically what everybody would assume a standard is it's like <laughs> you meet it or you don't meet it and 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 as i'm saying this it sounds like yeah i'm taking crazy pills because like <laughs> it's such a basic thing that we yeah. should be able to expect but then you then you go over to sfi and i really encourage all your listeners like just check out sfi's like the guts of the standard and this is super super nerdy but there is some laughable things in there it's some good comedy uh because like what they describe like what protections they would afford biodiversity is that you have to have a program that talks about protecting biodiversity. So, so if you're auditing that company and you're like, hey, let's see how this company's doing on biodiversity, you just look for, there is a document that says, we have a program in place that has these uh, values that we, we, we try to meet. We try, right. you know, but if they don't meet them, it doesn't matter because it's not a performance outcome-based standard. It's just a, what they call a process-based standard uh, or a management-based standard, where like you're just evaluating what they are saying that they're going to try to do, and it it just it it boggles the mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so for like FSC, yeah. um, they have a standard that says like uh, leaving twenty percent retention on, in like a certain block. For just just as an example, I'm just making this up. Um, and then they have people who go and make sure that they leave twenty percent retention. Yeah. But with SFI, mm. they can say like oh, we just need a policy in place that says you're going to have retention. Mm -hmm. And then you like you do the audit of them yeah. and you're like, okay, well, do you guys have a policy? And mm -hmm. they have a document that says like policy for retention. Yeah. And you click that and says, we hope to have 20%. Yeah. But yeah. then there's nothing there. Then they don't actually check what's what's happening in real life. So it's not actually yeah. about what's happening. It's yeah. just about the what the policies they have in place, quote unquote, that they say they're going to do. That That's it exactly. And, and uh, for example, under the CSA standard, the Canadian Standards Association, which is sort of of like the Canadian equivalent of, of SFI. Uh, deep in there, I found this uh, hilarious provision that basically says, if you find that the self-assigned standards that you, uh, you know, said you would try to meet, if you find that those are too difficult and you're regularly not meeting them, you may want to consider lowering them <laughs> so you start to meet them. Like it literally says that. And, and I, I just like my jaw dropped when I saw that, but it really is there. And, and I, I can show you on the page. <laughs> <laughs> so this certification process, quote unquote, we yeah. need like a new word because it's yeah. not a real certification. Yeah. This yeah. certification process lets you set your own standards. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then there's no accountability to whether or not you're meeting them. And if you're not meeting yeah. them, there's nothing like you don't lose your certification. They yeah. just say maybe try lowering your standards yeah. so you can try meeting those yeah. lower standards. This this is it. This is the the emperor has no clothes moment. Right. <laughs> when you just see it, it's like it's laid bare. There's nothing there. Yeah. And 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 that's what I want everyone to know is there's nothing there. And, and, and I would be incredibly unpopular, uh, for saying this and we'll probably have, Oh, I don't know. SFI might be litigious and they might, might want to sue me for this, but I, I invite people to see for their own eyes. It's it. That's the great thing about, uh, this system. It's all in text. It's on black and black and white. We can read it. Uh, and you can see for yourself, but, it, but the, the tricky thing is, is it, it says all the right things. It says, all the, the the progressive values of we are climate smart, we support climate smart forestry, we support this, this, this. So the, there's there's all these claims. All the greenwashy slogans you'd expect to see. Exactly. And so you can come out of it if you don't have a sharp eye to it and you just like kind of fall for some of that 
that uh, you know covering that that green cover, you can be like, oh, this sounds super f- like climate smart forestry. I like that. But what is climate smart forestry? It, there's no, uh, there's nothing that would actually hold them to anything, and so. It could be just like the same status quo that they've been using for the past thirty years. What, what would you What would you uh, uh, use to challenge them if, if they said that it's climate smart, and and you go through and it's like obviously the same old. But what would you be able to push back on? Because like the climate smart is not a defined term. You know what I mean? So this was this gets to the heart of what what eco justice uh, wanted to try to do. It's like what if what if the word sustainable is something that is knowable, is testable, has a, a, a way of knowing whether you're doing it or not. Could we say that they are defrauding the public, the consumer? They're making a claim to the consumer in providing assurance that if you buy this two by four with a logo that says sustainable forestry initiative, with their nice little leaf logo. Beautiful logo. Yeah. Oh, fantastic logo. And uh, you will know that you are supporting sustainable forestry. So the the premise of EcoJustice's uh, uh, challenge to the Competition Bureau, which is an active uh, investigation underway right now, they are, are, are testing the, the claim that sustainable means something. And if you are not meeting it, and that that you're not if your standard isn't capable of providing that assurance uh and this is based on an analysis of the actual text there's nothing in there that can actually uphold that claim well then you're you're defrauding the consumer and there's actually legislation in Canada that's you know you can you can hold them to under sort of false and misleading pretenses so under the csa claim you know we have uh uh grand chief uh stuart phillip Mm -hmm. uh as one of the complainants we have uh yeah you have to have six complainants six uh canadian citizens in order to make the complaint uh so grand chief stuart phillip um andy mckinnon uh another uh, legend another legend ecologist uh and and uh well there's there's uh a a number of, of very prominent um uh, 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 figures in BC uh, specifically that are signed on to that. Ferry Creek. And then that, uh, sorry, that was the CSA. That was the CSA one yeah. launched in 2021. So and, there are yeah. multiple kind of yeah. ongoing lawsuits against these these different certification processes. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say a lawsuit. There's a, a legal challenge, just a distinction being we're, we're not actually uh, like suing them. We're asking the Competition Bureau to investigate uh, and we're asking for a $10 million dollar fine uh and we're asking and we've we've suggested that could be awarded to uh in indigenous uh, forest conservation initiatives uh we are asking for these systems to be legally required to remove the word sustainable uh from their name and from any claims that they're making because of the uh, the fraudulent nature of that claim so this this uh you know is something that uh we're hopeful that we'll be at least uh, we'll start a conversation uh, uh, because we don't know if the competition bureau is going to uh, uh, you know be able to follow through on this. Competition bureau is notoriously under resourced. Um, they've they're they're trying to do everything from uh, uh, fighting uh, cell phone monopolies to uh, bread price fixing, uh, and we're here we're asking them to enter into the fray on on greenwashing uh so within forestry that's right yeah. so so we're really thankful that they they have decided to open up investigations but we know that it's uh there's a lot of uh, competing uh, uh issues uh, for their attention but at the very least we're hoping to get out there to uh the consumer uh this as a vehicle of of communication to like understand what's actually in there and that and that they should not uh uh believe this this standard uh as it's currently written it doesn't uh hold water at all and um so that's you know that's pretty important overall for the consumer level but i would say the bigger picture here is uh globally companies are using these this green cred 
to get by all sorts of things that are designed to try to improve the world, right? So the EU has introduced this legislation that will, you know, stop uh, products coming into uh, the EU that have been made as a result of deforestation, forest degradation, and and with all good intentions there to to try to improve the world, right? Well, and so just. Just a question about that. Is that just for like wood-based products or can that be things like um, if uh, a forest is cut down to create a coffee bean plantation, then those coffee beans could not, couldn't be imported? Like is it? That's right. So it's it's there's a whole uh, suite of different commodities that are caught up in that. Um, and uh, we are monitoring that very closely because there's definitely some exceptions uh, uh, that, 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 you know, that we're concerned that it doesn't include, including viscose, which is... Uh, uh, a fabric that's made out of trees. And I, that's something that, that I'm monitoring for, for, for Canopy Planet. Uh, uh, so we're looking to, you know, hopefully get that included uh, eventually. But overall, it's pretty comprehensive. It includes uh, beef, it includes soy, it includes leather. Uh, you know, it's a whole suite of, of, uh, of commodities that it's supposed to restrict uh, when it results in deforestation. Uh, so, so they're doing that yeah. like good intentioned. Yeah, and it's and they're. I mean, well, it's early days to see how that is implemented. Uh, side note: New York State has also got legislation similar to that. California has tried. This is an overall trend in that like consuming countries are going to start to care more and more about where their uh, commodities come from, and they don't want to be associated with uh, uh, you know degradation, and so. What we're worried about now is that if this um, forest certification, especially the industry-led systems that really don't have anything backing them, if they start to get like a green lane, sort of get out of jail free card through this legislation, it's all going to be for naught, right? Because they're just going to be in the very same situation we were before, where uh, they can continue to do uh, serious degradation of of forests, uh, violation of indigenous people's rights, and still get away with uh, a green stamp. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's so tricky to define when like the label of the certification is something like sustainable forests. Like it's sustainables in the name of the certification how can you argue with that exactly <laughs> and and uh and like don't get me wrong i actually support i'm a big supporter of, of forestry that's done well and i th- i absolutely believe it can be done well i absolutely believe that we can define uh, uh, uh standards in a way that can be upheld uh we have uh the vast majority of the world's forests are in a state of degradation that we can be working on them to bring them back. We can be restoring them. We can be managing them sustainable. But it's this uh, overall reliance on first cut forestry pushing further into intact areas that we just can't do it anymore. Like we really got to stop doing that. We know it's the worst for climate. We know it's the worst for biodiversity. So I would love to see a system that is wholly focused on bringing back forests from from degradation to a state where we're managing them uh, actually sustainably to the benefit of local people, to the benefit of indigenous people. Yeah. Which which is possible, and like I know very limited examples of that happening. Um, different like ecoforestry practices, like methods and stuff being used. Everything to like local mills, uh, people who who you know, like local uh, furniture artisans, for example, who only make things out of like uh, windfall or deadfall in in a city, like from city trees. So like there, there are ways where you can like find new ways to create a higher value added products in these forest ecosystems. I mean, even this little second growth forest we're in right now, you can see like, let's check out this snag right here. Like that's, it's coming back. We, we absolutely could be managing a system like this, looking around, you know, this needs to be thinned out. If we want this to eventually get to old growth characteristics, an old growth forest uh, would want to be a little bit more open. Um, you could easily take out some volume out of here and not only like not harm the forest, it could actually get better. So you could start to have more habitat for old growth dependent species just by logging this and thinning, thinning this out. Um, you know, I need to be careful because there 
industry has caught on to this and they do all sorts of things where they say like, oh, we're doing restoration thinning and, and it, it ends up being bastardized. And then we're like with the fireproofing, they're like, oh, we're going to go through in fireproof areas and they just go high grade and take all the biggest and best trees. Well, this, this, this you know, really gets to the heart of what we're talking about today is, is when terms are not defined properly, industry can find a way to completely bastardize and and use it as a loophole and that's the really annoying thing it's like we'll we'll start with a a a word that really means something like ecosystem based management and then industry seizes it and then like in this in this kind of like you know bizarre way we'll we'll uh twist the words around and all of a sudden they say well this is ecosystem based management as they point to a uh, massive clear cut and so, you know, whether it be restoration forestry or the word sustainable, this is a, a bigger picture where words get twisted and and it it, it results in, in bad outcomes. So what prevents that? Well, it's annoying people like me <laughs> that like are sticklers for making sure that words still count. Uh, and, and that's... Um, that's basically what we're doing with this uh, legal challenge is trying to make sure that the word sustainable still actually means something and that you can be uh, you, there's consequences for uh, fraudulent claims of it. Right. I mean, it's like it's like an all natural food product. You see at the grocery store that's like full of, filled with GMO laden stuff. You're like, that's right. What's the definition yeah. of natural? And, and there's a really good question there is like as consumers what should we be expected in terms of the research we have to do when i see a claim that says like fair trade coffee i don't know man like i'm i'm not going to go and do like my my phd research on like is it really fair trade no i i see a claim i should be able to trust it and and that is a fundamental role of government that they can do that on behalf of all of us so the competition bureau has that role to play in that they should be making sure for all of us that we don't have to do all that nitty gritty research. We can trust when a claim like that is made. Right. Yeah. I think it's interesting too that like all of these, like the whole reason that this is a, an issue or like all these different certification things are being created to kind of like fund this massive industry that's like propped up by shareholders. And, and it's like, it's like all of these massive conglomerates operating over massive scales of land, like there's no such thing as like local management when you're a company that large. Like, so it's like it, all the good things that you would see in like a locally managed, I think this is actually like a locally managed uh, community forest here, which is like way better than it being just like another Western forest product block. Um, but like, y y like, so how, like it's all these things basically cater to this like globalized system where like a few key players like the big five in bc dominate the industry as opposed to making the market actually like easier and better for the smaller like woodlot owners or community forests to actually make a product that like can be sustainable and actually truly helpful to those communities that depend on them absolutely there, there's a basic difference there where you have the people that are most affected by the forest management that live in that area that maybe they hunt fish and walk their dog in, in that area, they bear the consequences of the bad management. That is a very different feel than when you have uh, uh, people that are moving around, uh, around mobile work camps uh, that may not have any connection to the land, but are, are brought in uh, for you know a brief moment. Um, and you know I think that there's a, there's a real difference in when the community has control of their their forest management, of their tenure, they're in connection with it. They have vested interest in it. They want to maintain those trails. They want to maintain their connection. Yeah, yeah. And, and and beyond that, they want to they want a town. They don't want a ghost town, right? So all over BC we have ghost towns, some due to mining, but some due to uh uh you know logging old growth too fast. Not just BC, like all over the Northwest, like it's it's a it's a sign of the 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 boom and bust uh, of the northwest, and so what I would love to see is permanent communities based on permanent forests. I want to see thriving communities that are based on a sustainable rate of of cut that can actually be uh, uh, you know maintained over the long time, maintaining a diverse range of values from uh, you know fish and and wildlife. Uh, 
climate resilient forests that are going to be able to withstand what's coming in terms of, of, of climate change. Um, and, and what I'm seeing instead is like, we have this tendency to keep going a little further and, and into areas a little further away from town, a little further away from town. Out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind. And and what, what lies at the end, though, is is you can have, there's like an, only like an, a certain area that you can harvest that's economic to, to bring back to that mill, right? So, so what we're doing is we keep moving further. And this is particularly in the north of Canada with the slow growing trees of the boreal. And we're seeing some of these, these primary forests where we're punching new roads into, you know, further and further away from, from uh, you know, economically viable trucking distances back to that mill. And, and we're just depleting what, what's in that radius that's going to be sustainable. And we're doing that faster than the trees are growing back in that area. So what lies beyond that? Well, that's a town that's, that's uh, set to be a ghost town pretty soon, at least for a bit, at least for a couple hundred years while the trees grow back. Uh, so, so that, that's what really, uh, gets me angry is when like a company in, in Northern Quebec is able to demonize environmental groups for, for trying to, uh, stop, uh, you know, logging so fast when the trajectory that that company is pushing, uh, that forest towards is towards a brick wall where that, that town is going to be out of viable wood source. Yeah. Well, and especially yeah. because the way that those companies tend to, tend to divide the argument is mm-hmm. just saying that like environmentalists yeah. are trying to take people's jobs and, it, and, which and in they, the long term, it's just like you're trying to create job sustainability, like job security over the long term. And, and I would say like, that's, that's room for environmental groups to learn, to learn and to maybe admit that we messed up. We messed up in that you can't do campaigns in in northern boreal forest without first getting the local people on side. We could have easily gone in there and said, hey, look, it looks like on our uh, maps and our statistics, it looks like your town's going to be out of wood in about 10 years and you're all going to be out of work. Let's go talk to the company about getting to a sustainable rate of cut and, and what that looks like. Uh, that, you know, I think there's there's real, uh, so much room for environmental groups to do better at bridging that gap, social uh, labor unions and and getting the towns on board. Because, and, and same on Vancouver Island or anywhere on the coast, because ultimately what environmental groups are asking for is in the interest of uh, the, you know local populations as well. Uh, there's nobody on Vancouver Island that wants to be out of uh, to run out of trees to cut, right? Uh, people move to Vancouver Island because it's beautiful uh, and they want to have permanent homes, permanent communities. Uh, they absolutely don't want to be depleting their their resource they depend upon. So there's so much room for common ground. And I guess that's that's what frustrates me the most is when we're kind of falsely divided into these two camps, when actually we're absolutely on the same side. The enemy is companies right now that are taking their profits from BC logging and investing in other countries. Uh, you know, so I would say there's so much room for us to join forces and say, uh, hey, uh, you know, major corporation, we would like you to log in a really sustainable way and we want you to keep the profits local and we would like you to reinvest in uh, value-added manufacturing. Yeah, but like what, not to play a devil's advocate, but like why, what's going to get them to listen? Because even if like, because according to those SFI standards, like you mentioned, like they come through and they log a thing and it's certified SFI sustainable. Um, and then you go through there, you're local, you live in the area, you go through, it's a big cut block. You can't even voice a complaint about that, like you said in the beginning. So it's like, why would they even listen to the local Right. So, People. so what if we knocked out uh, their ability to rely upon greenwash? What if that wasn't available to them? That would be a, maybe the first start of the conversation. What if they actually had to come to the table uh, in a balanced stakeholder way and, and actually have to negotiate with workers uh, to negotiate that, that sustainable rate of cut? Uh, you know, I think that there's so much potential here to, to turn things around, but it starts with stopping uh, the, the greenwash and, and stop fooling ourselves that things are sustainable when they're not. If that actually changes, I'll tell you one really important thing that happens. So right now, this unsustainable rate of cut, it depresses the price 
of timber, right? If you've got these, uh, as I call them, the spaghetti mills spewing out, you know, millions of board feet of, of lumber at this very, very unsustainable rate. Why do you call them spaghetti mills? <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, those like Play-Doh machines who you like, you're just churning you're out just noodles. Churning yeah. Out, yeah. It just yeah. kind of like spits okay. it out. That's, that's <laughs> what I, I have in my mind here. Is just, <laughs> <laughs> I was like spaghetti mill. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you've got this like mass produce, uh, uh, you know, two by fours or whatever, or even, even beyond that, we're like, exporting raw logs so you you have that really depressing the price right because if it was actually coming out at a rate that is sustainable it would be a much lower volume and you know supply and demand it would probably be able to secure a, a you know a higher price for that um and then the local guys, we're talking about like local community managed forests. Well, then all of a sudden these become viable, right? Because right now a lot of the the low impact operations can't always go toe to toe with uh, you know competing for for uh, uh, the product on the shelf. So all of a sudden things really start opening up. We start getting you know First Nations forestry operations uh, that that could be you know low impact but viable. We start seeing you know the community operations start to be uh, be able to to stand a chance. And that all depends on on coming into uh, what is going to be a, a sustainable rate of cut, uh, which right now. By all accounts, we are above. We are. We always have been above. Um, as a as a very nerdy policy guy, I've gone digging around in studies since World War II that have documented and and warned about an unsustainable rate of cut. The annual uh, apple cut is set way too high here in BC. It, it's it's been it's been foretold uh, for for decades. Um, one one of the uh, reports it's called uh, fall down just if you want to google the report fall down uh, ecotrust and david suzuki foundation kind of in the 90s and they said we are cutting too fast in about 20 years or so we're going to see this massive fall down in the amount of timber that's available and nobody listened or at least you know in terms of how we managed our forest we actually cranked up the rate of cut uh, in those years so so it's kind of frustrating to see, you know, industry right now complaining about, oh, we don't have any available timber supply. Uh, it's all because of these awful environmental groups that are shutting things down. It's like, no, it's actually because you log too fast. And we've been telling you, you were logging too fast in the 90s. We also said that in the 70s. And it also is documented post-World War II in the Sloan Commission that like, we we're probably logging too fast. <laughs> wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's insane. Yeah, it's all there. I mean, that's the thing. Is like that's the frustrating thing. Is like it's the writing has been on the wall uh, uh, for so long that like you kind of wonder what is it, and that's actually something that guides my my investigations, my research, um, both in developing countries because I see a lot of the same patterns in developing countries. Like I worked in Cameroon, I worked in Sarawak and Borneo, and I see the same patterns in governance of of when there's poor forest governance and too much control by big uh, industrial conglomerates, we do these things that are so against our, our own interests. And so I'm actually quite curious about that. What What is these common elements in these different countries I've been to that lead us to this, these short-sighted decisions of, of a unsustainable rate of cut? Uh, why would we want to export some of the best logs in the world? Why would we want to export that without doing value-added manufacturing first and getting Keeping those the jobs? jobs here? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and this is also the industry that at least here in BC you're talking about is subsidized like millions every year to keep this sustainable model running quote-unquote sustainable model. So it's not actually sustainable because if you took away all that money, the whole system would collapse. If, if we took away those subsidies uh, for the industry, we would be able to start to see, you know, what what is real, what what can actually be uh, uh, supported in terms of, of an industry here. Um, you know, I think there's some good subsidies that can, uh, where, where there's a good that is you know, good for the, the population, uh, where we want to nurture uh, value-added manufacturing. We want to start having cabinet makers and guitar makers and not just raw log exports. Well, that, that sometimes takes some uh, propping up of subsidies. But where we don't need subsidies is is supporting the, the status quo, you know, uh, emphasis on large volumes exported at uh, very low value. That That's what I mean. Like a lot of those subsidies that were, were 
that the government's paying these companies now are going towards keeping operations existing. And they're still closing down mills and pulp mills and operations all over because they're logging way too fast. And when when environmental groups have attempted to point out the destructive nature of some of these subsidies, including, you know, uh, road building, reforestation, all, all sorts of things, overall very low rates of uh, uh, fees, stumpage charge for the harvest. When we have pointed that out, We've been called enemies of BC. <laughs> that was actually, a, I think it was a Glenn Clark quote from the 90s uh, saying that, that environmental groups are the enemies of BC because we were, uh, you know, in this softwood lumber dispute with the US and the US was claiming we were subsidizing uh, our, our forestry under, under trade rules. And when environmental groups kind of agreed and said, yeah, we absolutely are, we were like, we were seen as being enemies of the of the state um, and siding with the Americans, which is so you know <laughs> yeah. so bad. Uh, but actually, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but but when you look at it, what what are the environmental groups asking for? We're asking for for getting more value out of our wood products. We're we're agreeing that we should be securing more uh, revenue out of the the forest products we're we're selling. We were saying that we should take better care of our forests. How does that make us enemies? We're actually trying to, you know, make things better in in our own province. So, I that that really pushed me uh, further into the camp of like wanting to uh, make changes when I heard that. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just curious when we talk because there's like so many different avenues of definitions you could go down with like s defining the term sustainability. Like, is it ecologically, environmentally, biodiversity? Like. Uh, are, with both FSC, SFI, or any of these certifications, are jobs and community ever like economic sustainability ever like considered? Yes. So under FSC, uh, there are uh, considerations around uh, social uh, sustainability, economic sustainability. That's principle four and like five. Like you have to like employ X amount of people at certain living wages type thing. Like that's right. And there's there's indicators. There's criteria and indicators. So the criteria says, you know, here's what uh, you have to do, and then the indicators say, here's how you know if you're doing it. And so uh, I, I talked a bit about like those those international like high level. Uh, uh, you know, Ten Commandments. Well, that that's really gen generic. It's like, in general, you should you know achieve these social values, these economic values. But then locally, they would uh, uh, hash that out with stakeholder negotiations, and they would they would determine how many jobs per cubic meter do you want to attain. You can get very specific in like what what you want to get to, but it really depends on like. Yeah, who's at that table, right? And like I said, right now there's there's not that many people that are showing up to hold feet to the fire on those standards. So uh, I, I think there's some really committed people still at FSE, and God bless them. I'm glad they're there. But there's a lot of people that have stepped away because it's way too bureaucratic. It's very uh, uh, detail oriented. It takes a lot of time, and a lot of people are giving this time for free. It, you know, they're they're volunteering, whereas industry gets paid. So industry sends their reps; they they're doing it on salary. Well, the indigenous people and the environmental groups uh, or the local people often are coming to negotiate that on their spare time. So it's kind of like a, a not a fair table sometimes where those standards are negotiated, but but ultimately there are social and economic uh, values that should be maintained uh, within within the FSC standard. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. so so overall I would say that you know there's there's every reason to believe that you know forest certification could bring good things uh, if it's done right, if it's done meaningfully. But my research has shown there is no substitute for good forest management as dictated by government. That ultimately you need laws, uh, that that uh, a voluntary system applied by consultants is never going to be a substitute for good laws and good, uh, uh, you know, up, uh, upholding those laws with uh, uh, a neutral watchdog. Uh, you know, like the Forest Practices Board, um, except with maybe a little bit more teeth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
um, this is so difficult because there are so many different topics I want to kind of go through from sure, there. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, lots, lots to talk about, but I understand it's uh, far ranging. <laughs> right. I think towards the end, we should circle back to how we create the laws and kind of like what's happening there as far as like movement. But while you're mentioning the auditing thing, let's talk about the KPMG auditor. Yes. Report. Absolute bombshell investigation this week uh, that has come out as a collaboration of 40 different news outlets globally. So this is the ICIJ, the International Consortium, I think, of Internet of Investigative Journalists. They're just awesome uh, uh, in terms of their their power. They've got um, they, they've they've dropped a bunch of interesting stories, but one of them this week is an investigation right into this. And they looked at Canfor, KPMG, uh, a bunch of uh, certifications that happened, in, I think, in the um, Blueberry River First Nations uh, territory in the far northeast. And uh, I, it's a long read, uh, but if you if you Google uh, deforestation Inc. Um, or plus KPMG, the article should pop up. Um, and absolutely like jaw dropping revelations of how weak uh, these systems are and how the company uses that to get like kind of a green pass in everything they're doing. Uh, and that can be from selling it to the consumer or selling bioenergy pellets as climate neutral. Uh, that th- it, it kind of shows just how important and the consequences of getting this wrong. Yeah. I, I can drop links to this as well in like the show notes for people to check out as well as some of the other stuff that we've talked about. But like, what was, what's the big takeaway from this KPMG thing? Like, like how does, how does this system working? Like you were explaining it to me before we started recording, like, yeah. So the bottom line is like, you may have standards. So who is, who is KPMG? First of all, sure. Uh, KPMG is a large uh, consulting company uh, operating globally, provides millions and millions of dollars of services to the forest industry for things like accounting, various consulting practices. Um, and they're also accredited to uphold forest certification standards. So um, it's it's so dodgy, but like the very company that um, is paid to uh, you know do your certification would is also kind of an employee uh, because they're they're employed to do accounting services or whatever so there's just like this built-in conflict of interest that like you're gonna ask this consulting company and you're gonna pay them to certify you and of course they're gonna come out with a good result because if you were really being uh, uh, you audited know, like oh uh, yeah if you're being a hard ass and you're known to be a hard ass auditor well you're not gonna get hired again Again, because they can just go just go to another uh, company to get uh, audited. So this is this has been a complaint about uh, forest certification from the beginning uh, that there's this this sort of built-in incentive to uh, you know apply the standards very uh, loosely uh, because it's a profit-making business. To uh, KPMG makes millions of dollars off of uh, the these audits, and um, I've known this from the very beginning, and and. You know, I, I I think that everyone's been kind of crying foul over this, uh, but ultimately uh, it hasn't changed anything. Uh, so in this in this uh, investigation, they show what the consequences of that are. Everyone's getting rich. KPMG gets rich. Canfor gets rich, um, and the local First Nations uh, become very poor, and the forest becomes very poor. So so that's that's sort of the balance. Is that when it's a, a profit incentive, you you end up with these really bad outcomes. If you had government upholding their own laws, well, then they're independent, right? They're not getting paid by the company. Uh, so that, again, just reinforces the rule of law and, and government's really important role, uh, which, uh, to be frank, uh, they need to get back in there uh, and, and they need to start having more capacity to uphold their own rules. Yeah, agreed. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't help but thinking you were yeah. asking questions about like things happening in the Congo and like you're like, what is the link between all these different countries? And like, I mean, like the easy link is capitalism, but especially up here, it's like colonial extraction capitalism where it's like all these different companies, organizations, shareholders who don't live anywhere in the area are getting rich off the resource extraction and degradation of like these lands without the consent of the people who who these, these lands belong to. Yeah, I think the common... Whether you be yeah. settler or indigenous, it's like yeah. we're all on these lands and no one here is benefiting. It's like, Absolutely. I think that that's the common thread uh, is that 
there's a difference between forestry that's done in a way that is of benefit to local people that are staying put that you have to actually figure out what is sustainable on a finite piece of land right in the in the way that's happening in uh you know frontier forestry i would call it where places where we keep pushing in roads into new areas where we're doing uh, first cut forestry and old growth and primary forest, we don't have to figure out what's sustainable. We're always going a little bit further. And so that's what I see in, in, uh, in common, uh, in some of the places I was uh, working in the Congo basin and, and places in the, you know, frontier of, you know, Borneo or Amazon, where I also worked, it's like, it's, it's, you never have to, uh, uh kind of, come to grips with what's actually sustainable if you're always going further. And and on Vancouver Island, you know, we're down to the last of the last uh, in terms of, you know, drainages, uh, watersheds on Vancouver Island. There's hardly any left that haven't been logged already. Um, I went into, uh, you know, East Creek uh, not so long back uh, uh, with Mark Worthing actually on an investigation. And we saw logging that was primarily being done with dynamite. Okay, so dynamite was required to blast roads into areas so steep that some of the loggers were having to repel down with chainsaws because the the slopes were so steep. Uh, we should not be logging in these extreme environments. We should be trying to figure out how to log in a in a you know steady state in bringing back second growth for us and actually coming to grips with what it means to be sustainable in, in that area and not pushing into these extreme environments. That's yeah. incredible to me. I mean, like you're taking an already, already like one of the most dangerous jobs in the world and then you're putting them on steep slopes in a harness. Yeah. And then, and then what are you going to, are they planning on replanting those slopes? Are they going to reseed naturally? Cause um, when you look at like the way that logging on a slope that that's steep, like steep enough to the point where you'd have to be roped in to like be traversing it. The way that that affects the hydrology, that like that whole slope side, that whole hillside's coming down. I'll uh, I'll I'll, sh I'll show you uh, some some photos. Maybe you can can patch them in uh, uh, to your uh, website. But it the the uh, degradation of the soils and like the erosion that takes place after the root structures have been removed uh, from that that hillside uh, is just crazy. Uh, and um, this is maybe a subject for a, another time. But I wrote a re report uh, called "Intact Forests uh, uh, That uh, Safe Communities," which gets into like the uh, role that those steep slopes. Uh, and the forests on those steep slopes play in stopping uh, landslides in stopping things like the crazy flooding events that we had in November 2021. Uh, you know, these forests play such a critical role. And and in the, in the face of like climate change, where we're going to have more extreme precipitation, we need those forests on those slopes holding the soil. Uh, and, and I really hope that um, we're going to start turning things around before we, we, you know, log more of these really extreme areas. Right. And it's, yeah. it's one of those things, like I talk about this quite a bit with my work with redfish restoration. Mm. There was a report that came out a while while ago, not a while ago, it was like two months ago, which relatively is not that long. Um, but it was detailing like the impacts of logging on watersheds, like the the main kind of factors that Im that impact anadromous fish and like their ability to survive, um, from steelhead to cutthroat to um, different chinook and and coho species. Um, and like the biggest thing of, from like marine to freshwater ecosystems, the biggest impact was logging. Any kind of logging within a watershed increased like rates of of or decrease rates of survival to like something like 2%, 1% in some cases, any kind of logging and persistent effects that last up to 30 years. So it's like you look at like the lack of like habitat for salmon populations coming back and it's like when nearly every watershed has been logged like this, yeah, like that's awful. And then, and then of course, like the landslide thing, like everybody thinks about landslides relative to like watersheds and it's cool when they're, or it's not cool, but um, it's like, it's one thing when they're in uh, remote watersheds that you never have to see or do anything but like with the level of development that's happening and expansion that people are moving out there's like all sorts of like risks to communities that happen like um here in squamish there was like a a, 
a secondary road going up Mamquam to get to the highlands. They logged the shit out of that a couple of years ago. And then like literally the next rainstorm, the whole, it took out the yeah. road. And it's like, now the road's closed. There's yeah. only one way in and out of the highlands. It's like, what did you expect oh, was going to happen? Yeah, it's so and predictable. Have you heard that... of um, the, the Oso landslide in Washington? No. Oh man, that was like, I want to say 2011 or 12. I'd have to fact check that one. But yeah, landslide, they logged just like big, like small logging community. They had logged this hillside above it. Um, and then I think like four years later, the whole slope slid, took out this community, killed like 40 people. Oh, geez. Okay. Uh, that's absolutely tragic. And, and this really brings to mind for me is like, this is not an environmental tree hugger only issue. This, this impacts, uh, communities and their safety. This impacts fishermen and their livelihoods when you take out all those streams. So I I absolutely reject the notion that this is some niche issue that just environmentalists should care about. This is everybody. This is this is this is this concerns everybody. This is the entire town of, of Princeton and Merritt that got flooded. Uh, uh, this is uh, about you know small communities that are facing uh, you know closures of mills because uh, the 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 company logged too fast. Like it really is time that we get everybody caring about this, and and we've got a big tent to fill here because there's a lot of people that should be caring about this, and I think uh, environmentalists need to get better at welcoming more people into that tent because we've got a lot of of uh, really good partners out there that that should uh we should find a home in in this movement yeah and for so long all these conversations have been siloed where it's like if you're not a forester or have any direct relation to the forest you don't necessarily have a say on how things are happening in forestry but like yeah like you said fishermen should be involved like and everybody within any community from every aspect should be involved in these discussions because everything is intricately connected absolutely and and even in an urban area like vancouver um you know when we get a ton of uh forest fire smoke in there in in town i want people to think about the fact that uh that we need to have more resilient forests uh, at, at, at that are not uh, so fire prone. Uh, second growth forests, when they're kept in a perpetually young state, are always going to be more susceptible to to uh, forest fires than uh, older, uh, you know, wetter forests on the coast uh, that that are better able to withstand that. So yes, you maybe you don't even go into forests, but if you want to have uh, less forest fire, forest fire smoke in the summer, we got to get this forest management thing figured out and to be doing it sustainably. So I, I really think that there's so much room for, for inviting more people into this conversation. Um, and, and what better way than at the store when you, you know, are going to see a label that says, Hey, you're the, the paper you're buying for your printer is, is sustainable. Well, maybe we should be able to count on that and actually be able to say, you know, what's, what's really sustainable. And that should mean something in that label. Yeah, totally agree. So you mentioned, uh, like, so laws are the one thing lacking that's holding us back from this. How are things going with that? Is there any progress, any movement in creating laws or policy to uphold these certifications? Um, there is such a a, a, a a bigger story there. I mean, overall, we had an attempt after Clackwet Sound in the 90s, there was an attempt of, of creating forest practices that were going to be stronger. Uh, later on in the 2000s, that got uh, gutted. Uh, and and we're, you know, we saw a big uh, um, kind of rollback. And we saw a move towards uh, professional reliance, which basically means that we're not going to uh, have a, as many people out in the field checking in on things. We're going to have comp companies uh, uh, that are like consulting companies hired to do those, uh, which that really didn't turn out very well for some reason. Right. Um, or people like self auditing, self monitoring their own. That's actions, right. That's right. As, as, as long as they're, you know, uh, professionals, RPFs, uh, registered professional foresters, uh, then we're going to rely on that professional designation instead of having actual regulation. So that didn't really work out very well. Um, I think overall now we're seeing uh, how that deregulation has played out and it's not good. So I'm hoping there's now an appetite for coming back into having more enforceable, uh, sort of stronger regulations. One really great development actually to just like put in a good note, uh, you know, when, when to, 
give props to the government um, has announced that they're going to take off this provision that was causing a lot of harm. They used to ha have in their um, in the in the forest practices this uh, kind of caveat that like yes we'll look after like fish, but we're it can't. Uh, unduly restrict uh, the rate of cut. So, uh, uh, or, or we, we want to look out for, you know, the spotted owl, but it can't unduly restrict the rate of cut. Uh, so that's recently been uh, announced that they're going to take that off, which is really great because that means you'll, you know, be looking out for these values and not have to be concerned about is that going to, you know, stop your ability to, to log so much. So there's some improvements. There's some signs that like things could change. I'm optimistic that the current government is actually moving in the right direction on that. Um, in terms of like, are there laws that guide the use of the word sustainable? There's some really interesting things happening in Europe right now where uh, companies are getting slapped for, for um, uh, using that word uh, in, in a misleading way. Uh, companies like H&M have recently received uh, a punishment. Um, and then, yeah, the Dutch government is starting to impose greenwashing legislation. So I'm watching that really closely because that's super interesting. Uh, that means that there could actually be some consequences to uh, greenwash. Yeah, which would be awesome to see. That would be really interesting. Um, and then we'll see what comes from the Competition Bureau. Uh, I really hope that they, you know, they know that there is a public appetite out there uh, that they that they want to be able to believe in claims of sustainability. Uh, I'm really hopeful that they will, uh, you know, come, come to the conclusion that I did, uh, which is that these systems uh, don't have the ability to provide that assurance. Do you so. think a lot of this stuff is happening now as a result of the Ferry Creek blockades and everything over the past few years? I think the Ferry Creek bl blockade has has brought about uh, a, a real uh, focus on uh, on old growth issues, uh, no doubt. And uh, you know that Ferry Creek uh, area is certified as sustainable, even though there's only about seven or eight percent left of the original level of old growth. Uh, that is a, a SFM, Sustainable Forest Management Certified Operation, uh, that entire uh, tree farm license, uh, Teal Jones is, is certified. Uh, so we use that as a, a vehicle uh, to demonstrate the awful outcomes that can happen when the standard isn't a standard at all. And uh, uh, TJ Watt has got some incredible photos that were used uh, to, you know, show uh, uh, some some clear cuts, um, some very famous clear cuts. Uh, do you remember that that photo that was kind of a before and after shot that was in the Guardian newspaper? So there's a photo of TJ with a massive uh, old old cedar and, and forest, and then and then the after photo is like that as a clear cut so th that that uh, got a lot of fame uh, a couple years ago well that that's a csa certified cut block um you know and and then like last year there was that picture of that massive old growth tree like on a highway and people were going nuts mm -hmm. over it because it's like the the, sicker. yeah that monster like i i don't have like you know uh, specifics on it but i would I would bet you that that comes from a certified operation because all of Western forest products and all of uh, the North Island is certified as being sustainable. So I, what I would love to have is like, I want people to start making that connection that these things that we care about are getting this green stamp of approval. I don't think people know. And, and so that's why we picked Ferry Creek as a, a way to uh, connect it. Uh, and, and I think that the more people know about some of these things, the more outraged they will become and, and the more they will demand uh, uh, for government to actually step in and, and do something. Well, so yeah. yeah, just that, you talk about people demanding for government to step in, what mm -hmm. can people do? Uh, they can absolutely write their member of uh, uh, the, the legislative assembly, their MLA, uh, you know, they can say, this is an issue that I really care about. Uh, I, I'm going to be voting on the basis of whether you do right by this. Um, and I am going to be watching, you know, just letting, letting people know, making this public, any social media on this is fantastic. Just getting, getting a, a bit of a conversation going, uh, making it visible is really helpful. Uh, you know, uh, letting the, the ministry of, uh, forests, uh, letting, uh, David Eby, let, uh, let, you know, George Heyman, minister of environment, um, 
you know, as they're doing some of these good uh, measures, such as removing the uh, restriction on annual allowable cut, uh, uh, you know, we need to we need a signal that they're in they're going in the right direction. So so give them kudos when they do the right thing and let them know that uh, we will be approaching the ballot box uh, uh, the next time round. Keeping in mind if they're on a, on a, a good route here, and um, they absolutely uh, do respond to that. Uh, MLAs are actually incredibly nervous, especially in swing ridings, about where the electorate is is going to go. And of course, you know, there's a, a hundred other issues that are stacked on top and are competing for your attention, healthcare, the economy, et cetera. So it's always helpful to have people bringing this up, saying, no, this is actually something that I, I mm-hmm. vote on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. From a consumer uh, level, like if someone's at the grocery store or a supermarket, or not, I mean supermarket, yeah. they're at Staples, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and they're shopping for a printer yeah. paper. Yeah. Like FSC's top choice, CSA, SFM, SFI, all those are just like basically meaningless. Yeah. Yeah, certifications. So, so I would say, um, you know, and and what uh, Canopy, uh, the organization that I work for, what we say is first and foremost, try to ensure that the products you're uh, buying don't come from ancient and endangered forests. We have a map on our website that shows, you know, roughly where those are. But the truth is that that even FSC doesn't. Uh, eliminate uh, uh, sourcing from ancient and endangered forests. They still certify in those areas. So, so we we guide uh, the brands that make a commitment to canopy. We guide them towards uh, ancient and endangered f- free forests. Um, uh, but once you're out of those forests, then we say look for FSC because that is the most credible certification system uh, that that is out there. Um, SFI and and CSA or another one to look out for PEFC which is uh, kind of an overarching umbrella system that endorses some of these industry-led systems, uh, they're not worth the, the paper they're printed on, so to speak. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I really stand by that. And I, anybody that wants to challenge me on that, I, I encourage you to look at the eco-justice uh, legal challenge. It's all there in black and white. We have laid out exactly why we believe it. It, it that is the case. Uh, and it, it really is a matter of like, you kind of have to look at the guts to understand why it's not meaningful. And they're kind of counting on that. Uh, they're kind of counting on just like, I'm not going to go look up the fair trade rules of the coffee that I, I believe in, in fair trade. They are assuming you're not going to go and look at up, up those those standards, uh, but I would say uh, if you're interested, uh, it's there for for all to see. Um, but when you're in Staples, when you're in the aisle of Home Depot, right? What do you do? You're just like you're 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 gonna either trust a label or you're not, and that's where we need government to actually uphold some kind of rigor here because consumers are getting duped, we're getting defrauded, and and it's just not not great uh, scene on, on, on that front. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. I don't have like an easy answer there. I wish that these labels were meaningful. Uh, and, and I, you know, hopefully in the future they will be. Yeah. Um, so I'll throw links to canopy planet and all the resources we've talked about today. Some of those articles with TJ's photos are great as well. Um, yeah. One of the things that I like to do, like there's also a couple other things if you're that I've suggested to people who've reached out to me on Instagram about like trying to find sustainable practices. I know there's an organization or a company in, I don't know if they're based in Vancouver or Victoria, I think maybe Vancouver called Unbuilders. Yes. Where it's like basically like they're deconstructing, yes. like instead of just yeah. tearing down an old home to yeah. build like new condos, they're yes. literally piece by piece deconstructing this like old growth dug first yes. from like the thirties and reselling that at yeah. like a, at like a comparable rate. So it's like, yeah, you can always, depending on your project or your need for wood, if you're at Lowe's and trying to figure it out, that's like a good option. Like there's definitely like a local salvage, like old growth salvage, um, yeah company near you again like local community forests and stuff like i've always i don't really know where to get wood that comes from those well you, you just to, to talk about unbuilders a bit like you raise a really good point we get so concerned about like oh how are we gonna do like better forest management but what if the question is reduce reuse recycle first right we it, it completely gets around that conversation so canopy actually first first and foremost we encourage reducing consumption we 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 you know do you really need that you know uh uh 
whatever you're about to buy, just just pause and think. Maybe you can get it from like uh, an already used, uh, uh, you know. Uh, recycled version instead it doesn't have to come from virgin fiber um you know look we we're encouraging next generation fiber uh production out of things like agricultural waste or even recycled cotton recycled recycled textiles that are being thrown into the dump well what if we can make whole factories making paper and and uh, uh, other products uh, from uh, what's currently considered waste, right? So it, it, absolutely, Unbuilders uh, is fantastic, but we can think about that for all sorts of products. Um, on my on my from my own uh, like COVID project, um, I actually uh, went to a construction site and picked up a uh, uh, like massive amount of uh, two by fours that were just being thrown out uh, because they were like concrete forms or they were used for scaffolding. And I just had to pull the nails out and then it was perfectly good wood. And I made a, a picnic table and uh, a bunch of planters out of it um, as, as just as like a, a gesture. But yeah, overall, there's so much waste in this world and we can absolutely be doing better uh, to, to yeah reduce reuse. So really glad you brought that up. Yeah. I'm a big fan of pallet furniture. I've got all sorts of pallet stuff in my house. Yeah, little benches and coffee tables. Fantastic, man. Yeah, there's I and it there's also such a great satisfaction when you build something and you know uh with your own two hands. For those of us stuck behind a laptop a lot of the time, uh being able to like use uh scrap wood or put together things that are otherwise being thrown out and you make something with your own hands so satisfying right yeah. totally mm -hmm. and even from like because i know there are like small businesses and small brands that use um different like paper for like coffee cups for example that are like certified so i think like again from a consumer level if you run a business and you're using those products try to make sure you're only buying the best things or even if you are like a someone who goes and frequents it, frequents your coffee shop and they have well, first of all, you should probably be using uh, reusable glass yeah. first and foremost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> if they their paper cups are from a not sustainable certified source, you can try to direct them to that. Like tell people to kind of look out for this. I think it's a lot about just like spreading the awareness and the messaging. Yeah. Even just asking uh, when you're, you know, in a, a store like Home Depot, ask them, uh, do you sell uh, wood that can, that's, uh, you know, not from old growth? And just force put put them on the the back foot and have to answer your question. Are you able to tell me how do you know this is from a sustainable source? You know, maybe not quite as pointedly as that, but just like just casually, like you know, hey, I'm I'm in your store, I'm I'm a consumer, I I'd love to be able to buy wood that's not causing like you know bad things happening in the forest. Here here are my concerns. Uh, what where, what can you show us? And when they show you SFI. Uh, point them towards the legal challenge and say like, no, I don't, I don't actually buy this, um, and I'm not going to be buying this. Uh, so you can, <laughs> you can, you can just like start a conversation in the aisle, and maybe you know it's just some some uh, you know sales rep is like, I don't know, man, just like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> two way fours. Let me speak to your manager. But uh, you know, you can you can pop it up on on social media, tag Home Depot, and say I would love to be able to buy uh, uh, wood that comes from uh, sources that. I can trust and you know maybe just just get them thinking about it I know that like Lowe's right now um, and, and is is starting a conversation about looking at uh, improving the way they do their sourcing and it's totally on the basis of customers like saying that they yeah they they get they get prompts they get um, you know I think a lot of these people they don't want to be doing the bad thing uh, they they're willing to do uh, you know, whatever keeps them in business and turning a profit. So if their customers are saying they want to go in this direction, they'll, they'll listen to it. Yeah. And I don't think they, like a lot of people who work with wood in any kind of way, like I know there's like all sorts of like custom sauna, sauna and furniture makers, like locally here in the sea to sky, even um, like, you know, if they were aware of where their wood came from, like, I'm sure they would like, they want healthy for us just as much as anybody else. Like, that, that's it. And that's what, re what really gets me angry is like the people that reach for this logo are probably doing it because they think it's sustainable. So I think that there's so much room for, you know, seizing upon that inclination to look for uh, sustainably sourced wood. And just if we could direct it in, in a good way, uh, in a meaningful way, in a way that's not deceptive, uh, we could really start seeing some good things happen. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add? 
Uh, no, this has been a, a great uh, conversation, uh, pretty far ranging, and I uh, really appreciate the chance to, to chat about it because, uh, you know, I think it's something that is kind of runs in the background, doesn't often get a lot of exposure. So yeah, I appreciate the ability to, to talk to you today. Yeah, yeah, totally. Thanks for coming on. It's been great. Right well, uh, last question, like with your sure. last name, Peter yeah, Wood, yeah. have you always been just like a forest guy? Like wood guy? Like... <laughs> yeah. It's the first thing I, I start wearing when I'm, I'm lecturing to my students. I'm like, let's get this out of the, out of the way. Yes, I have a sense of humor about the fact that my name is Wood <laughs> and that I teach in the, you know, in forestry. Uh, you know, the occasional joke when I register for forestry conferences, it comes up. I try to act surprised, though, each time when someone, you yeah. know. <laughs> like, oh, wow. I never heard that one before. Yeah. What do you know? Yeah. Huh, I never thought of that. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's a great place to be. Great yeah. place to have your head in the uh, woods. Yeah, exactly. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, really great to uh, chat with you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks so much. Cool. Ooh, that was a solid dump of information there, huh? So in the past few weeks since Peter and I have spoken, there have been a few updates that I wanted to mention here. So the day that he and I spoke, a really interesting article from the CBC dropped detailing the level of lobbying that the Canadian government partakes in to change some of these international regulations that we mentioned, uh, like the one in New York State and the one in the EU that aims to prevent products linked to forest degradation from coming in. So this article is definitely worth a read um, to give you a better understanding of just how involved the government is in trying to basically protect the industry and keep them operating at the status quo. Um, the EU has also recently announced that it is developing anti-greenwashing criteria to avoid misleading environmental claims, which is pretty sweet. Um, so I'm going to throw uh, links to both of those things in the show notes here. Uh, God, you know, now we just dumped a solid hour and a half of information on you, which is a lot. And I know that that can be really overwhelming. So what can you do to help out? Well, combating this greenwashing is a really active thing that requires a lot of involvement from the public at times, and that is where you all come in. So if you're at all concerned or have issues with a product that is greenwashy, you can let the Competition Bureau know by contacting them on Facebook or Twitter at Comp Bureau, um, or by calling them at 1-800-348-5358. I'll put that information in the show notes. Um, the Competition Bureau has also asked EcoJustice for evidence that these claims of sustainability are being used to get consumers to buy their products. So if you see the SFI logo specifically on any things that you buy, uh, such as toilet paper, you can help by posting these to social media using hashtag greenwash and by tagging EcoJustice to help raise awareness. Also, if people are interested in taking action to protect old growth in BC, uh, the Wilderness Committee has a really good action page for calling the premiere, which I'll link to along with all those other references above and all the things we talked about in this episode. I'll put that all into the show notes. So... Every episode, I make a donation to a nonprofit of the guest choice, and today, Peter has chosen the Awi Nicola Foundation, or the Tree of Life Foundation, who are doing some really amazing, interesting work linking scientific research, indigenous knowledge, and art. You can learn more about them and what they do at awinacola.com. That's A-W-I-N-A-K-O-L-A.com. Uh, Nerdy About Nature, as you know, is a fully independent passion project that is solely supported by folks like yourself who help me create these podcasts, videos, and support awesome little nonprofits like Albi Nicola. And I choose to keep it that way because not only do I not want to be here selling you things that you don't need to get by, but you don't enjoy that and you wouldn't want me doing that either. That would suck. So remaining independent like this allows me the freedom to have in-depth conversations like these and not feel as though I can't say something or talk about something. And should I ever get sponsors or partners for this podcast or anything else, it would only ever be with folks who I truly align with 100%. So if you're enjoying these podcasts and all the fun vids you see all over social media, you can help support their production and keep it independent by becoming a Patreon supporter for a dollar a month or more at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature. You can also help support this project by sharing it around, rating it up wherever you may listen, and by leaving a comment to help get other people involved. You know, any little bit here helps, and it all goes towards spreading this good information further to help create a better world in the future. You can also check out nerdyaboutnature.com, uh, where I've got all sorts of merch and some potential upcoming nature walks, so stay tuned there. Now, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you've had a chance to get outside and enjoy the weather wherever you may live, and I'm looking forward to catching you all next time. Till then, take care.